Um, let us begin today with a review, if you call. Notion of last time that I introduced, I call a Riemannian bundle metric. of this for you. We have these spaces of, of symmetric bilinear forms. So this or moving, you should think of this as a moving space of symmetric bilinear forms over the base. So this is symmetric bilinear forms over a point uh, P1, let's say, and this is the symmetric bilinear forms on the fiber of P1. So this is the symmetric in your form. On E1, E P1, let's say, and the similar thing for P2, and the similar thing for P3. Of course, you have this trivial form, zero, but you have everywhere in every fiber the positive and definite forms. This is a well defined notion. And then a section here. Which we call maybe B is a section. So at every point, a smooth varying section in this positive cone. So that's that's what a reminding bundle metric is. Now we've talked about the word metric. I'll go and we're all confused maybe about the word metric. For now, this means just an inner product, a positive definite inner product on each tangent space, which is a section of this bundle that means moving smooth. Now, a Riemannian metric on a manifold on M, so whenever I write M, it's a differential manifold. Is such a thing, but it's on the tangent, but it's just a Riemannian metric, bundle metric on the man on the tangent one. On the tangent one. So you have the same picture, except it's special bundle, it's the tangent bundle. And uh, the notation that is al almost always used is this Riemannian metric is usually is called G. One M is somehow always called G. There have been many G's in my lecture, so this might be confusing. This G is Gauss. Gauss. From my feeling, did not understand this viewpoint. Gauss was primarily uh, focused on surfaces in 
three-dimensional space, or at least embedded, embedded manifolds, and pulling back the metric from the embedding. I will talk about that a bit, but this is the abstract version, uh, version of just an abstract Riemannian metric on M. This is, was known to Riemann. I think this report was in Riemann's, what we call in German, Habilitations, uh, uh, right? this is something like, I don't know what it is in other countries, but it's when he really uh, wrote a very serious deep paper and it was accepted by the faculty in, in Göttingen and Gauss himself even praised it. Gauss, okay, yeah. So, okay, so G, G is, uh, let me just write it this way. I'm going to write G of P, maybe, is then uh, a symmetric positive definite bilinear form on the tangent phase at P. <clears throat> we were talking uh, after the lecture last time. Uh, if you write this in a local trivialization, where the bundle is trivial, then G of P will be a matrix, a symmetric matrix. So the matrix, and quite often I learned from our physics colleagues, that they would like to write this matrix G mu mu. So it means that if you take a vector in this in this trivialization and the G P of, of applied to X Y as vectors, then in the trivialization is by definition X transpose G uh, G as a matrix. So let me just write it here. No, I, no, okay, G mu mu y. Of course, this is symmetric matrix. So let me reiterate what the picture is. The picture is we have some abstract manifold. We don't know what it is. It has an interesting topology, perhaps. Uh, some handles, some high non-trivial handles here, I don't know, coming up. And of course it has to be smooth, so you can make it like this and so on. Uh, M, and fundamental importance is to study curves, for example, in this manifold, curve, gamma. So a curve in this manifold is, as usual, just a map of the interval, some interval, say, uh, I, from A to B, that orientation, and you have this curve here, gamma, from gamma to A to gamma B, just the usual thing. And, and now, coming back to a point I tried to make, I'm not sure how successfully, um, if you have a vector field along that curve, Interested, and you call that vector field a force field, like we were calling. We're having this debate about what is a force field, what is a vector field, what is a differential form, and so on. But if you have a vector field along that curve, let me just draw a picture of it, the vector field along that curve. So you say x is a vector field along gamma. So if you like, it's dot is defined define your gamma if that's all we need to do. So it looks something like this, some vector field here, maybe it's occasionally a tangent, and then it goes in other directions and so on. There it is. And the uh, physics way of talking about some interesting integral here is to 
is, is to, here is the velocity, oh, that's a very bad color. So, so, at each point we have the velocity vector of this curve, this is gamma point, and here the yellow thing up there is, is my version of the vector field, so that's, this is gamma point at this point here, and this is x at this point, gamma t. And what you could now do, and what you could not do before in this discussion, is you could take the inner product of, gamma, of, the, of the vector field with the tangent vector. You could now do it. Okay? So this says the g at p of gamma point, at, well, let me write even very carefully, at gamma of t, that's the metric at the point, applied to the vector, tangent vector, gamma point of t, and the vector field, this makes sense. Right. The gamma of t, the vector field of the gamma of t. A gamma of t, thank you very much. This makes sense. So this says that we can define something, if you like, called work. This is simply then maybe the work of this vector field along gamma, I don't know what, I'm just writing something for fun here, integral a, b of this quantity. Okay. So when you see scalar product, it means, instead of g, it means you're in flat space with the standard Euclidean Riemannian metric in flat space, and work has been, been computed with respect to that. When I say flat space, I mean flat Euclidean space. It means G at P is constant. It's just the constant standard scalar product. I'm over at some point P, a vector here at P. Another vector here at P. I say, okay, my Fußpunkt here is P, and I just use a standard inner product. And then using that, you have the usual definition of work. Okay. So there are many ways. Once you know uh, what he was asking last time about this the notion of metric and distance and so on, once you know a metric on a manifold, so if if, uh, I'm sorry, if, G, if a metric G is given, so if MG, if somebody's from England here, this is not a car. MG is a car. Do they make MGs anymore? I don't know. Probably not. Probably. English is very interesting. It's very fascinating to me that uh, many of the Formula One uh, companies production of McLaren, Red Bull, for example, except for Ferrari, they have very good contacts with, with, with uh, English manufacturing. But the reason it's very interesting is because of Oxford. And around Oxford, many non trivial engineers work in these country companies. But I'm not so confident about English industry in general, but Formula One, very confident. Red Bull, for example. So, <laughs> but I think MG no longer exists, but, yeah, by anyone. English industry something that's very mysterious to me. So MG is called a Riemannian manifold. So uh, that's, I'm just introducing some notation with it. So we have a Riemannian manifold. And then you see if you have a curve gamma, gamma is a curve in this manifold. Yeah, so gamma, a, a curve in, in this manifold. Then, of course, I can compute the length of this curve. Huh? It's very easy. Anybody can compute the length of it. Well, it's just simply the integral, let's say the curve is from A to B. It's the integral of the length of the tangent vector. Uh, of course, that's the square root of the norm. I emphasize defined by the metric uh, G along the curve. If you're in flat space and using the standard metric, this is what we talked about yesterday, the length of square root 
of D is clear what this means. Yeah. So this is the this is the length of the of the, of the curve. Now you were asking about the word metric, and you have some feeling when I say metric, it should be a distance. So what you might hope, and you come close to being lucky, is defining the distance from P to Q to be the minimum, or maybe not a minimum, infimum, over all curves, uh, gamma, of length of gamma. Of course, I need the condition that gamma uh, is a curve from P to Q. Right? So, isn't that reasonable? I mean, uh, if you want to know what the distance is from here to, uh, you take, well, what, what is the distance from here to Munich? I mean, here's the sphere. Uh, you take all the possible outer bonds to, to Munich, and, uh, okay, theoretical outer bonds, yes. But don't you need like a compact manifold to get a good result? Why? Or at least locally compact. Well, it's certainly locally compact. All manifolds are locally compact. What do you mean by this? I mean, that thing, the infimum, I mean, it should be attained by something. I mean, when I think of a distance... You're starting to make sense, but you shouldn't have said it. It has nothing to do with the manifold. It could be compact, and you have the same problem that you're worried about with non -compact. He's worried that if you take the infimum over all these curves, that this is just going to be some absolute nonsense. This is going to be a virtual thing. It's not going to exist. Hmm. And that, that is, of course, right. Then you might say, these, these are smooth curves for me. What you might think is reasonable is take the infimum over all piecewise smooth curves, right? Because Elterbahn, you might want to go to Dortmund and then down and so on piecewise, and it'll be faster. And you'll be coming close to what is correct. However, mathematicians have learned over the years to use something better. The word you will know, the word is geodesic, but geodesic is not defined by distance. Find some other way. That's right. So you can imagine. Something to do with parallel transportation, and physics immediately knows about these notions. But I just want to say we're close to it. I mean, I don't know what you're looking at. You're checking me in, the, in your uh, cell phone here. <laughs> you're calling your mother in China. So, okay. We're coming close to the notion of length. Okay. And I agree with anything you say here. But that's the reason I wrote the word, 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 word hope. Okay. So, that's one reason to call this thing a metric, is we're coming close to notions of distance. Okay. I think that's all I want to say right now. <clears throat> Maybe I want to say one more thing right now. I think it's a good uh, didactical point. If you have a metric, uh, no, let's say if E is a vector bundle equipped with a bundle metric G, uh, I'll call it B. It's not necessarily a Riemannian manifold. It's just some vector bundle, bundle vector B. Then E has a trivialization. Has uh, is, is trivial over a covering. Let me write it carefully. It has a trivialization, has trivialization over a covering. So u alpha alpha via orthonormal frames. That means. Okay? So what this means is you have E 
over u alpha. Of course, this is bundled over alpha. This is the identity here on the base. And we have here uh, uh, u alpha. And we have here uh, u alpha cross rn. And we have this map, this trivialization mapping, phi alpha, which sends a basis here over u alpha to a basis here over u alpha, right? So it sends, let's draw a picture of this to make sure you understand this. So here, here is, oh, this is going to be a terrible thing. So I'm going to have to, I don't know how I'm going to do this. Let me try anyway. I draw the fiber as being one-dimensional, that's impossible. Yeah. Ah. What I will do is do it this way. I will... Uh, okay, here is zero in Rn. That's zero over the base u alpha. Each fiber is a vector space, and each vector space, so each fiber is a vector space. I'll give it a shot. I'll give it a shot at drawing a picture here. Uh, maybe you're bored by my pictures, but I have fun drawing them. Uh, each fiber here is a vector space fiber. This is a uh, rank two, say, vector bundle over u alpha. And here we have. Uh, the standard uh, orthogonal, uh, okay, we, how the heck do I do this? <laughs> um, I'm getting nervous here, how do I do this? So, ah, oh, I know how I do this, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, so, it's here the standard orthogonal frame, E1, uh, E2. And in each, each vector space, it gets complicated, so I won't draw the vector space. In each vector space, in this flat trivialization, I have an orthogonal frame E1, E2, the flat frame. Because it's a product. Why did you put zero in our end there? What does that mean? Very good. So it's the zero section, which consists of zero in each Rn. Okay? That's, uh, but it should be written carefully, thank you. So, so in each, each Rn, oh, this is, in this case, let me just be precise so that you see what I'm talking about. In each, in each R2, you have this, the standard frame. And because, and because we know what the metric is here, we can organize this thing to be uh, fiber-wise simply an isometry. So the, the picture uh, looks like this. So here is, here is the same picture, so I'm going to write this as the zero section now of E alpha over U, E over U alpha. And this mapping uh, in the local trivialization takes this moving frame, which is uh, well, trivially moving, it's the same frame everywhere, into a really, into, you should think of it into a moving frame, but into a moving ortho, ortho, orthogonal frame. So it will look like this maybe here, but maybe it'll look like this here, and maybe it'll look like this here. But nevertheless, we move it into an orthogonal frame here. So that means you have local trivializations with orthonormal frames. Okay? Now, Fact, everybody knows here, if we have a, a vector space with a, a positive definite bilinear form V, some people call this a Riemannian vector space with a positive definite, and we have E1, uh, let's say E1 through EN, uh, uh, an orthonormal frame.
and you have F1 to Fn, another orthonormal frame. And change of frames, so the transformation T of Ei to Fi defines a transformation. Right. This is a matrix, so uh, T of Ej is, is I don't know, Aij F, F, uh, I. This thing is a matrix, and guess what kind of matrix that is? From one orthogonal basis to another, this matrix is in, in ON. This matrix is in ON. This says that P is in ON. R. So what you wrote there, I don't think is correct. What? The second row we wrote, P, J, A, I, J, F, I. Is that true? What does that mean? No, so we wrote above the T, I is F, I. And below we wrote... The oh, thing. oh, excuse me. Change frame, and that means from EI to FI. Yeah. Yeah. And then you have the matrix of the of you have the matrix of this transformation. I don't know what the matrix of the transformation is the transformation in Rn with the stand with the metric at hand, and it's, it, this, this matrix is an orthogonal rate. Okay, so look what happens. What has happened? What has happened is that the structure group G, which was GLN originally, so if you just have any random frames here that aren't orthogonal or whatever, just some random frames, has been reduced. to ON. Oh. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. No, 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 Chris, I mean, we did all this stuff and we got here, like where we reduced G. I mean, couldn't we have started from the beginning knowing that there is a bilinear firm? Because, I mean, we in all the problems we're working with GL, uh, GLN, yeah? But we know that there is an orthogonal structure and, I mean, we know that we can find the standard linear product on Rn, and we can transfer it to the to a bundle metric. So why do we work Everything with Everything you said so far is absolutely correct. Why do we work with GLNR from the beginning since... With, you mean with ONR? Yeah, since we have the structure of orthogonality in Rn. That's right. I mean, we have it from the beginning. We have one structure, yes. Okay, but we have the structure, the usual standard structure. Does everybody understand this good? Why, why all this stuff? I mean, we might as well start with the structure group ON. Yeah? Okay. But the reduction of the structure group depends on the metric. <laughs> I use the metric to do it. it. It's a question of what comes first, the chicken or the egg, in some sense, right? I mean, that's what you're saying. Yeah. And I'm saying, you have a vector bundle, and this vector bundle was given to you by somebody, and unless he tells you what is some additional structure on that, for example, it's the whole business here of computing work by projections. Unless somebody gives you a Riemannian metric that seems to be relevant for your problem, you can't tell me that I should reduce the structure group to, to the orthogonal group. You can do it and have fun doing it, and it's always possible. What you're saying is absolutely always possible. So that, that's an abstract statement. Let me just say for people who are, you know, know a little bit about mathematics, this, the fact is that GLN has a maximal compact subgroup which is called ON. And this, every, every such Lie group is, every such maximal compact subgroup of a Lie group is a strong deformation retract of the big group. And any strong deformation retract of the structure group defines a, a reduction of the structure. This is what's really going on here. In this case, I, I, that was just abstract mumbo jumbo, I'm sorry. But here's this big GLN, and in it is the fundamental compact thing. Yeah? And you can believe if I can move the structure continuously, or I don't do much with the bundle, and it's absolutely right. 
so I can move the structure down to this compact thing. I would like to move it to the identity and then it's a trivial bundle. I can't do that, but I can move it down to the maximal compact subgroup, in this case, ON. But a canonical way of doing it is with orthonormal frames from a given metric. And I think I, that's the best I can answer it. Mm -hmm. A metric is part of the given structure, for example, of the physical problem. I am very adamant with my friends. They say, let M be a Riemannian manifold. And I say, no, M is not a Riemannian manifold. Please write the right notation. And finally they write, let MG be a Riemannian manifold. Yeah, because it's really the fundamental structure. Yeah. I don't know what a Riemannian manifold is without G. Yeah. OK, I think that's enough to talk about this. I would now like to go to Lorentzian structures. And I will strict, restrict my discussion to Lorentzian four manifolds. Okay. Okay. So what is a Lorentzian four manifold? So G is a Lorentzian metric. For example, the tangent bundle of the manifold. So, uh, by short, we just say uh, G is a Lorentzian metric. That's just notation. Means that G of P. has signature 3, 1 at every P. So all P. Okay. So <coughs> G is a symmetric bilinear form. Okay. It has eigenvalues, eigenvectors, and so on. It has a three-dimensional positive eigenspace and a one-dimensional negative eigenspace. Okay. As you are in the tangent bundle, you have a three-dimensional tangent space, and somebody says, Here, let, let's say, here's a three-dimensional tangent space. I can't do it. TP of M someplace. Some guy says, well, here's the negative space. Negative space. And, and then transversal to this negative space is the positive space. So this is one dimensional. Uh, and this is three dimensional. Right? This is, of course, some guy can say this. You can say anything. There's a nice thing about mathematics. You can write it and then erase it. But this is nonsense. Because there's no such thing as the negative space or the positive space, right? If you take a space, a line, where a line, a one-dimensional line, where this metric, this, this Lorentzian structure is negative definite, that means the norm of everything in that is minus one, and you move it a little bit, small earthquake, even rather big earthquake, uh, it'll stay negative definite, right? Take a positive space, three-dimensional space, if this were a negative space, then the positive space obviously is complementary. <laughs> it's obviously complementary. So it's a direct sum of the tangent space into a negative space and a positive space. And a small earthquake of this positive space is still in there. Right? But it's absolutely non-canonical. I don't know. Okay? So there's no canonical decomposition. This is, this is, this is possible. Of course it's possible. But it's not canonical. Yeah. But the, the eigenspace is, I mean. The eigenspace of the symmetric ma matrix. Uh, I mean, we define it by the eigenspace, right? 
It's very good. I'm very happy for this. Uh, if you can, so what Alexandros just said, uh, I, I, I probably mix you up by saying a symmetric matrix is diagonalizable with eigenvalues, three positive eigenvalues and, right, and, and one negative, right? But I have chosen the symmetric matrix, representation of the metric. In a vector bundle, in the tangent bundle, there you have to choose a basis to do that. I mean, you have to choose, I don't know this, you have to choose a trivialization to do that. Okay? <coughs> there is no canonical, right? However, there is a way of making what I would call an orthonormal basis. I'll tell you how. Choose a positive vector. Okay? That's a one-dimensional subspace. Choose a positive one-dimensional subspace. Okay? Take the orthogonal complement of that. That is everything that's perpendicular to it by this form. This thing is a direct sum decomposition. Do you understand that? This, if you take, it's very important. So a procedure. For finding. Uh, and I'll just write it here, ortho orthonormal basis. Well, I take any v, v in the in the, in the ten, in some vector, say this is in the vector space v. So in 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 v equipped with a bilinear form of signature three one. Take any B and B with uh, norm B, so squared, with respect to the same positive. Okay? Then I define E1 to be V divided by the length of E1, uh, to be V divided by the length of B. It's a unit vector. Yeah. Why don't you start with a negative vector? If you want, I can just start with a negative vector, but I, I don't care. Yeah, yeah. If you have more fun starting, what is this, some Schopenhauer-esque statement? I mean, it's negativity or something. No, but I mean, can you just start with a negative vector? Okay, I'll make you happy. <laughs> no, 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 but the question is, you just get a positive three-dimensional okay, space. Okay, I'll start with a negative vector. I just did it for you, okay? Now, okay. Let V2, I, I, probably I see your point, you're a very efficient guy. So, so let, 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 uh, let's say L equal uh, the span, so R times E1. Okay, that's a line. And, and then consider L per and V restricted to L per. Right? Me, I, the efficient guy that he is, said, you know the story about mathematicians are smarter than engineers. And you know, the, the, they have this, comp you know the, the story, how you do this. There's a competition on the stage. The, the, uh, the goal is to boil water. And so it's a setup like here. There's a, a, a plate to put, you know, a plate to put uh, the water here. And uh, there's a, oh, it's exactly the same setup, and there's some water here, right? And uh, there's a bucket here, and, and oh, no, there's a, no, no, there's a pot here, yes? And this, the, the pot is empty, and the water is there, and the bucket is there. And the goal, the goal is to, the project is to boil water. And it's a competition between the engineer, you know the story, of course. And you, you don't know the story. It's a very good story, or if you like mathematicians. <laughs> <laughs> the goal is to, to boil water. So the, the, the mathematician comes to the door, and the referee is sitting here, he says, boil water. He, says, he looks around, he says, okay. Takes the pot, no, takes the, the bucket, fills up with water, brings it over to the pot, puts it on, boils water. Fat. Engineer comes in, it puts it back to the original situation. Engineer comes in, takes the bucket, fills up with water, 
pours into the pot and puts it on, on the stove, boils the water. Same solution. So the referee, referee says, try it again, do, do it again in the competition. Okay, the engineer comes in, takes the bucket, comes over, fills it up, pours it into the pot, puts the pot on, boils the water. Right? He actually takes this pot and he leaves it over here for the heck of it, I don't know why. The mathematician comes in and looks at the situation and takes the pot, puts it back where it was, and says, I've done the problem before. <laughs> so this is Mihai. <laughs> well, this is Mihai because Mihai, and I was going to be very inefficient. You know, if you start with minus one, it makes life really a lot easier. I don't have to say induction or anything. See, if I start with plus one, and I look at the orthogonal complement, it's a signature 2-1. And I don't have much experience with, I have to apply induction to, to n, where it's n1. But what Mihai says is do the minus 1 first, the orthogonal complement is a, a positive definite bilinear space, and we've done that before. <laughs> okay? So you see, I get an orthonormal frame. Naturally, what I don't get here, is um, uh, I cannot do this. Uh, you see, me, me, I, uh, I was, I was, I was going to. Uh, <laughs> you see, me, I, this is squared, and I, I have the, the length here. So uh, somehow or another, what I have to do here is. Square root of one is that thing. I have, yeah, I have to organize this thing to be minus one with some square root. So okay. So to do to make me happy, I probably have to do this. <laughs> no, no, it's minus is inside. Huh? No, minus is oh, minus the inside. Now I make it positive. Yeah. And it's okay. Yeah, okay. I'm a complex analyst, so I don't care. <laughs> okay, but you see the point. It's, it was your point. I, I can do that. So I get an orthonormal frame, and I have many orthonormal frames. If, you, if I hand you an orthonormal frame, you're going to tell me, I'm not sure that was on Alexandro's point, probably, orthonormal frame, you're going to say you chose a line, the line's there, right? I mean, it's this, it's this first axis. But there are many. The only thing is the change of frames, right? You will change frames with some structure group. The structure group has been reduced here to the structure group SO, uh, O31. So the structure, this is a reduction of the structure group. to O31. It makes sense. It's the orthogonal of the group of isometries of, of the standard form of signature 3-1. So you see all of this structure always goes back and forth with reductions of structure group. By the way, for the, for the fans of the of Lie group theory, this is the standard choice of the maximal compact subgroup uh, in this context. No, 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 let's stop. I'm sorry. I, I, what, I, I may have said something. Wait a minute. Oh, reduction of structural group. Yeah, no, this, this is not yet compact. I'm sorry. No, this is... What, what are we doing? No, 031. This, this is not yet compact. I'm seeing this is not yet compact. So I... I what I just said is music of the future, which will happen later in this lecture. So not yet. Sorry. Okay. Now, now we come, I think, again to a, a nice provocation of the eye. Why didn't we just start with this stuff at the beginning and a heck with it? Right? That's what you said. Your remark needs my theorem that says every manifold has a Riemannian metric. Right? So I would now like to explain to you that essentially that very few manifolds have Lorentzian metrics. So that this is really, it looks very, very parallel, but it is interestingly enough a very heavy condition 
that you have such a structure. By the way, if you want to have some fun, guess how many components this group has? Play a role, interesting role in, in relativity theory. Okay. So uh, before we do that, let me just example that I wrote on the board last time, the Schwarzschild matrix. So this is on the manifold which has trivial tangent bundle. I've dug out of R3 a hole, a ball of radius. I'm trying to write this in physics notation. This, these are the so I have here uh, a decomposition of the positive space and the time space. And the usual, because the hole is round, the usual uh, coordinates are spherical coordinates. last time is this is x, y, and z. And you have this vector here, this length is r, it projects us here to theta, and I think this angle to the z-axis is phi. And time stays time. So the metric is now, this, this, uh, this tangent bundle is trivial. And the frame, the global frame, I'm just writing down what we really have. Uh, I should write the space variables first to be consistent with positivity coming first. Will be d, dr with my space variables dr, d theta. Uh, no, I want to use the vector. I'm terribly sorry. The global frame is dr, dd theta, dd phi, dd t. So this is a global basis, you must agree, of the tangent space. If you want, at each point, I evaluate at each point p, this is a global frame for the tangent bundle of R3, R4, R and I restrict it here. And the metric, in my notation, in this basis, is a symmetric matrix. Right? It's a symmetric matrix. So let me right here just emphasize this is, uh, we were talking the other day about Jimmy Mu. This is your Jimmy Mu. Um, this is a symmetric matrix G Mu. -mu. And the Schwarzschild, so I have to tell you, it's, it, and it's even diagonalized. Uh, so if I remember this thing correctly, it, I have to just reconstruct this from my own thinking just a moment. Uh, it gets killed off here. Uh, no, it blows up in R. Uh, uh, what am I doing here? R over 2n. So you see, this is uh, the length of R. This is going to be, this is going to be symmetric. It's going to be diagonal. So I, I hope I have enough place here to do my diagonal. That's the R thing that's going to blow up. The theta thing... It should be minus one. Not in R. To the power of minus one. Huh? You said it blows up. Otherwise, then it goes to zero. You 
It's the other way around. Four to the power minus one. The norm has to be positive. Right. So it's minus. No, it's power to the power minus one. R is bigger than or equal to 2n, so the number inside this thing is negative, and if I put a, a minus sign in front of it, it's now positive. I'm just saying it should be 1 over that thing. Huh? Because you said it's so one R is getting close to 2n, this is getting close to 0, which doesn't blow up. Oh! Oh! I, 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 I'm sorry, yes. <laughs> Boy, you, you people are really uh, keeping me completely... This is what you meant, right? Now, now this minus one is no longer needed. Huh? What? Because what do you mean? I wrote a different answer today, that's what we say. Okay. <laughs> For r bigger than or equal to 2n, or bigger than 2n, this, it's, this is 1 minus something smaller than 1. But it goes to but 0. R goes it goes to... to oh. It goes to zero, and, yet, and I want this thing, it goes to zero. I understand. I want it to blow up. That's what you were saying. Because yesterday I wrote it correct. It's great I get this lecture twice, and I, I get a chance to get it right. So, uh, okay, now yes, remind me what I said. What should be the norm of, of theta? I think the norm of theta should be r squared, right? So this is r squared, 0, 0. And the norm of phi is r squared sine squared of theta. Now I'm going to have, have to make some plan. And then 0, 0. And now I have to uh, put what is the norm of t. And t dies as I go to the black hole, right? So t, I want something that here, here I want what I this thing without the minus sign. Ah, but with the minus sign. Okay. So now we see it's a diagonal line. We see it's hit split in, even in, in a really nice, easy way into a positive negative stuff. This is a positive Make some sign of saying it looks okay now? Yeah, it's like this. Okay. <laughs> it's bound to be okay. <laughs> so uh, the things in the middle, r squared and r squared sine squared of theta, do they come from the transformation from normal coordinates to spherical coordinates? Because they look like they come from there. Maybe. I, I don't know. I, I only. No, this is the way every physicist writes this metric, so I don't know. Maybe check it. Could be. I mean I would agree hundred percent with you intuitively because why should there be some oscillation in this thing? Right? <laughs> if you look at it in rectangular coordinates. What's happening to this metric is I mean it's really out there, terribly oscillating, right? Or have, or, or have I not misunderstood the situation? Theta, what theta, oh wait a minute, how's theta, how's theta going? Uh, theta, no, theta goes from 0 to 2 pi, right? Yeah? So you may very well be right. That's some example that I don't know, I'm not sure. I would like to devote the rest of this lecture to an outline of 
the following fact. So the kind of discovery is just discovered by that. I mean, or he did he like? He has some physical model that produces it. And I think it's the first thing you look right. I mean, this is the first thing you look at. Isn't it? Well, you just said it. Like, this yeah. Is the... Yeah. Yeah. I mean, for me, this is the same. So I'm only writing it down because I know in physics they write it down all the time. Okay, fact. M G Lorenzian and compact. So M should be a compact now. This is really a beautiful fact. Watch this. Topological order characteristic of M, which is usually called key M, is zero. Well, there are many modern ways that I like to define this order characteristic, but you, you know it from your high school math for surfaces with a triangulation. You know what I mean? A triangulation of a surface. You just piece together the triangles to make a surface. Right? So, I mean, I try abstract triangles and you piece them together to make a surface. And the topological Euler characteristic is, I'm trying to think which language this is in, so vertices minus edges plus faces. Let's go very slowly. Let M be a surface, let's say an orientable surface to make life easy. You may triangulate the surface, this is a classical fact known in, to everybody back to the beginning of mathematics. Okay. This means that there are maps, if you like even, there, there are diffeomorphisms defined in the neighborhood of triangles mapped into the surface, okay, a number of them, so that edges match up, and you cover, the only, they only overlap on edges and vertices. Okay? That is a triangulation of the manifold. Okay? You can count the number of faces, that's the number of triangles. You can count the number of edges, the number of sides. So and you can count the number of vertices, right? So you do the triangulation on the charts, you don't do it in the, on the manifold, no? The triangulation, I just, I'll say it again, a triangle is a diffeomorphic image, or even a continuous image, homeomorphic image, of a triangle. We don't even need a manifold, it's a topological space. It's a piecewise linear structure, and manifolds have them anyway. Does that answer your question? I mean, it's a very weak triangle. Yeah. For manifold, I can locally some some local stuff would be isomorphic to a triangle. For example, maybe even something that looks very global. For if example, I, it is unique. For example, I can have more. It's not triangles. unique. To, uh, the, the very good. I'm glad you're complaining. <laughs> it's highly non-unique. <laughs> yes, it is highly non-unique. But, but some guy, and I think this guy may have been Euler in the early days also for other reasons, pointed out that the answer you get doesn't depend on the triangulation. Because 
for, for a polygon, it's two, right? But for, for anything, it's true. For any two numbers. For numbers anything, two. it is true. So for those, this points out how fundamental it is to understand the basic subject in mathematics, which is called the basic components of algebraic topology. And for anything, if you understand the most elementary thing about algebraic topology, you will easily see what I just said. It doesn't depend on the triangulation. Yeah? And it's true in any dimension. And it doesn't require manifolds. Okay? But it requires triangulizability. I mean, you need something like that. Yeah. I know that this ordinary plane is equal to 1 if you don't count the, if you count the ocean. Is it 0 in a manifold because you don't have that ocean outside and you just... That's right. So you, so you, um, that's very, what is very interesting. What, yeah, what you're saying is, so in the, you really have, this manifold is compact now. So you may be used to, accustomed to do this in the plane. And so you will have some outside boundary and you will get different out answers depending because of that. Okay, that's, the answer is yes to what you just said. If you have a sphere, let's, let's have some fun. If you have a sphere, then you realize, after you talk to your sister who's six years old, that if you can make a sphere by a triangle on the desk here, and suspend and point up here, and connect all these lines down here to this, you see what I'm doing? I'm making a pyramid that even has a name in the subject. I'm making a pyramid, yes? And I have uh, that triangulation, so that, and that's a sphere. Your six-year-old sister says, okay, I smooth it out and make a sphere. Okay, so that, that has how many faces? The base I started with, right? And it's interesting now, I started with a triangle. So I started with a triangulation, I made a suspension, and I got another one. So it's somehow an inductive procedure. If I would go to higher dimensions, I'd start with this thing, take a point, and make my connections and get a higher dimensional thing. Right? I always use triangles for this kind of thing. Other people might use other things, but I like triangles. Okay? Okay, now let's count how many faces we have there. I see four, is that right? Base and the three, right? How many sides do I have? One, two, three, going down, right? Plus the three down there, six, plus, and I have four vertices, right? Okay, so for a sphere, uh, I get the other characteristic, RS2, is not what did I just say was? How about four vertices? Uh, um, ah, it's two! Huh? What's two times it? That formula equals to two multiplied by Euler characteristic. You think the Euler characteristic is one? Mm -hmm. No, it's not it's two. Euler characteristic is equal to twice the genus of the surface. I didn't say anything about a genus yet. Yeah, but that's what. Well, yeah, but that's what. That's you introducing another fancy invariant. Oh, Can you define the genus? By Euler characteristic. Huh? Oh, <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You see, you're mixing up things that you don't know about. So now let's go. Let, let's go to a torus. Well, okay. So a torus. You have to think about a torus. You can have a lot of fun with a torus because a torus you all think is a parallelogram with opposite sides identified, and then you can think about what is a, a triangulation of a torus, right? And you can compute. And you get a other characteristic here. Well, the torus here it has one hole, a sphere here has no holes. And this other characteristic of, of this thing is zero. Okay. And now you can think, instead of just having some formula in your head, yeah, is how do you make the next surface from a torus? Well, you attach a handle. Right? And now you have to think, if you have a triangulation, well, if you do it in a, in a systematic way, you attach it on a triangle. So you, you bore out a triangle of, of the triangulation of the torus, and you bore out another triangle, and now you take a cylinder over these triangles, right? You see the cylinder, right? And you attach it, and then you think about making a new triangulation, what you get. Okay? This is, this is easy construction. So, 
For a double thing, we attach a handle. And for a triple thing, we attach another handle. And Clavis wants a formula. And we find out that the number of handles, the number of holes, G, so this is the number of holes, and maybe this is what you're thinking of, about. Right? And you prove it. You define an order characteristic the way I said for you to define it. This is not a modern way to do it. If you know any topology, it's the alternating sum of the Betty numbers of the manifold, or it's alternating sum of the dimensions of the homology class. This alternating sum corresponds to realizing this manifold as CW complex. We're doing this through a triangulation. And this is the beginning of algebraic topology, and not just fiddling around with triangles. Okay? And it's easy by what I just told you how to attach a handle if you believe that everything comes that way to prove this formula. Okay? You notice that the only example here with other characteristic zero is a torus. So you notice how rare it is for Euler characteristics to be zero. So you start to get, even though you don't know anything, some guy tells you, and then I tell you, for mg to be a Lorenzian and compact, the Euler characteristic has to vanish. That's really, really special. Okay. Now I'm going to tell you, you know, this is so beautiful, I'm going to take my time and even talk about it next time a bit, too. Let me tell you how, why, How do I prove this? How do I prove this fantastic result? Well, and I'll tell you the idea in five minutes. So bear with me, and next time I'll be more precise. Okay. I have a Lorentzian manifold. This is some Lorentzian manifold. I have a point of this Lorentzian manifold, and I have the tangent space above that. This is what uh, we got off on with Alexandros before. There's no such thing as the negative line or finding a canonical choice of negative line, but the cone of negative vectors is a well-defined object in that tangent space. There's no question about it. The problem is, this cone is not connected. It's a double cone, right? Because you have the cone where, where if, if you write this thing down uh, non-canonically with time and, and space coordinates, you have the cone where time is positive and the cone where time is negative. It's not canonical, but you have two cones, right? So your picture here is, your picture here is, <laughs> you have the cone of negative vectors. So the cone of negative vectors. Uh, and, and a cone in a disconnected sense of negative vectors. Now, suppose this is a terrible thing. This is disconnected. You see it. I mean, I could hold it. Here's the top part. Here's the bottom part. And now I start with a point here, and I start running around the manifold. I'm sorry. He's making a video, so he has to follow me. He's running around the manifold. Uh, OK, pretend I ran around the manifold. OK, I started upstairs, and I ran around the manifold. And I come back, and I may be in the, uh, in the lower thing. You know an example of that. It starts with M. It's the Möbius strip. Exactly that. And then you can organize this so that, in fact, you come back to the same line over the same point. That's the section, or what is it? Yeah, come on. I go back, and I come back to the point, and I do this. Right? 
So I started upstairs, and it's not, it doesn't connect because I come back to the bottom component, right? I mean, I don't want to use bottom component, the other component. But of course, that's a closed curve on the base. Okay? Now, as you see, these upstairs and downstairs don't make sense. But what you can prove, and I will prove next time, is there exists a rank one sub bundle of the tangent bundle. So this point is not well defined, no point here, is, but I can make a line that is well defined. You see, this point is not well defined because I go around and I don't know what I get, but I can make a line that's well defined. That means in the tangent bundle, I have a well defined line, I make it. Okay, I'm going to make it, for, not canonical, but I'm going to make it everywhere. Okay? Now, that's in the tangent bundle. It's a well-defined line in the tangent bundle. It could be a non-trivial rank 1 vector bundle. However, if every time I have a loop downstairs, if every time I have a loop downstairs, I can, make, I can move it to a point. Yeah? This is called homotopy of the loop to the point. I have this line bundle over here, and that's a Möbius strip, maybe. I have a line bundle here on the smaller thing, it's a Möbius strip, probably. I move it to a point, I get inside a trivialization. This is not any Möbius strip anymore because it's just a product. That is, if I can homotopy that to a point, that line bundle is trivial. Okay? If I can homotopy that curve to a point. If I can homotopy every curve to a point, this line bundle is the trivial sub-bundle of, of, of the manifold. Okay? So, if this manifold is simply connected, that means I can homotopy every, every curve to a point, like that, then there exists Trivial line sub bundle. Line bundle. In the middle. I am sure that your physics professors say this in another way. I just, I just don't know how they say it. Huh? They have the cone of light. They have the cone of light and they have all these lines. If the manifold downstairs is simply connected, you find a trivial line bundle and a tangent bundle. Do you understand what I mean? It's really a trivial line bundle. If you have a trivial line bundle, you have a section which doesn't vanish anywhere. That's a pretty stupid remark because it's just a product. <laughs> I've had a non-vanishing section. A section in a tangent bundle is a vector field. That says that if you have a Lorentzian manifold, it, which is simply connected, and you don't even need to do this. Uh, for those who know, you can pull it back to a 2 to 1 cover and pull this bundle back and you, and, you tribute, and you find out that this bundle over the pullback is trivial. So this does not change the Euler number at all. So you might as well assume, in fact, that this line bundle is trivial, that you have a non a, a vector field which vanishes nowhere. That's a wicked condition. A Lorenzian, effectively, a compact Lorenzian manifold has a vector field which vanishes nowhere. There's a small adjustment. Yeah? I don't need this strong homotopy system. The reason I wanted to tell you this <laughs> is that I wanted to tell you one of the most beautiful theorems of mathematics that I know. This made me fall in love with mathematics, truly in love. I fell a little bit in love and then truly in love. When I heard about this theorem. This is the theorem of Hoff. Originally discovered perhaps in some trivial situation by point per but this is really a theorem of Heinz Hoff, and it's rather modern. <clears throat> Hoff asks the question, 
how do you compute the Euler characteristic of a manifold with vector fields? Alone, this question is an incredible question. So, up steer. Total index. Tell you how to compute the total index of a vector field. Are you ready? So a vector field is a section of the tangent bundle. Here is the zero section. A, no, a, sta a vector field, a random vector field, is a horrible thing. So I'll write it in brown to remind you how horrible it could be. Maybe it's even zero on a big set. The first idea of modern mathematics in this situation is inside the space of vector fields, you can homotopy this vector field by a smooth homotopy, move it by a smooth parameter so that the intersection is finite and transversal. So we make it, we have the same tangent bundle. We have the same tangent bundle. Sorry. Tangent bundle. This brown is, is bad because it's brown. Let's have something happy. Lavender is a little bit happy. It's, it's transversal. Comes back. Isolated zero. Transversal. Transversal and so on. Transversal means this is a two n dimensional manifold here. The zero section is n dimensional. The section is n dimensional. This means the sum of the two tangent spaces is the full thing. That means transversal intersection, right? The sum of the two tangent spaces, the whole thing. That's a transverse. You can homotopy a vector field to that situation, and then you can count the number of zeros. 10 zeros, 27 zeros, 86 zeros. And you would guess that this, this counting is an invariant of the manifold, right? How many zeros does a vector field have? You're wrong if you make that guess, because you have to guess with the appropriate orientation. And I will tell you the appropriate orientation. If you have a zero of this vector field, P is a zero of this vector field, you take a small circle, a disk around this, a small ball around this thing, and the vector field is still lavender. And this vector field, now I can make this a unit, I, I, uh, I normalize it to make a unit field, unit lengths. I take any met metric on this thing, I'm, I'm giving in to me, I'm taking some metric on this thing and making a unit length vector field. And this is a vector field here. Maybe sometimes it's tangent, sometimes it goes out here. Okay. okay. And I'm mapping each point of this boundary to the unit sphere. Right? Because this is a unit vector field. I'm mapping each point of the boundary to the unit sphere. Okay? So this boundary here, this ball, gets mapped to the unit sphere, which is 2n minus 1 dimensional. Every map of the ball, well, it's also a sphere. It's the same, the same sphere. Every such map can be homotopied to have finite fiber. You know, nothing catches, you know, nothing catches. Finite fiber. 
20 points in the fiber, 87 points in the fiber, 9,000 points in the fiber. Right? You do a little looking and you find out there's a huge open set on the base where the fiber number is constant. In fact, there's a huge open set on the base where this is a covering space. This constant number is called the degree of this map. Degree 2 and so on. Okay. If you count this properly, with, with, with orientation and so on, you get what we call the index of the vector field at the point, and the Euler characteristic <laughs> is the sum of the indices over these points. So the sum of the zeros counting the right kind of orientation and multiplicity. Isn't that one of the most beautiful things you've ever heard of? This is incredible. And the corollary is, if a vector field doesn't vanish, right, there's nothing to discuss here, right? It says the Euler characteristic is zero. If we have a Lorentz manifold with this, we build a line, I'm going to show you how to build this line in it, I produce a non-vanishing vector field, really, on a two-to-one cover or something. doesn't matter. Yeah, I produce a non-vanishing vector field, and therefore this. Now, let me just say what that, an example of this is. I just remind you that the Euler characteristic of a 2n uh, of, well, let's see here. What is the Euler characteristic of S, I don't know. What is the Euler characteristic of S3, S4, S5? Euler characteristic of S2, we just did it, right? Is, is 2, right? What is the Euler characteristic uh, of S3? What's the Euler characteristic of S4? I'm writing this here. Maybe I should leave this for a fun out exercise for you. I claim you get here zero. You just check it. You can imagine how to, you know what a sphere is with triangle. You can make spheres with triangulation, right? You can just make it. And just compute. You can have some fun. And you can make a recursion formula for computing Euler characteristics. If you know something about topology, it's alternating some of the betting numbers. So B0 is, is, is 1 for the force field. B0 is 1, B1 is 0, B2 is 0, B3 is 0, B4 is 1. Let me see. 1 minus 1. That's 2. That's I mean, 1. Minus 0. 1 minus 1. What do I get here? Do I get 2 or do I get 1? Minus 1. 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 We know that. S3, maybe we get zero, I think. Yes. I think it alternates, doesn't it? Between yeah. even and odd? Mm -hmm. It would seem to me it alternates. So you see, uh, you don't get zero here, of course. You get, yeah, here you get zero, and here you get two. The reason I mentioned S4, this is R4 plus one point. And every one of my physics colleagues when they have a phenomenon on a, on, a, on a vector space, imposes some condition at infinity. It's a very natural thing to do. You impose some condition at infinity to handle, yeah? And that's saying you have some continuation of something to infinity. But I guarantee you, you cannot continue the Lorentzian structure. There is no Lorentzian structure on the force here. Okay? So it's a very rare thing on a compact manifold. Here on this, on this non-compact manifold, it's a joke to construct it because the tangent model is trivial. It's only a question of writing down this symmetric matrix. And so Schwarzschild has his physical ideas and writes down this symmetric matrix, and that's it, basta. Okay. So I will explain some of this next time. I think it's rather amusing. So thanks.